Well, hello, Believelings. Today's special episode release is a rare glimpse at our expansion episodes offered on Patreon. These are strange times indeed, and we know now more than ever there is a hunger for uncovering the mysterious things and recounting mind-bending tales that make this place so strange and wonderful. In light of this, we would like to present Expansion Episode 2 from the beginning of the season, wherein we explore skinwalkers, dark native magic, and monsters of the Southwest. It's one of our personal favorites, and we know you're going to dig it. If you like what you hear and need more Belief Hold a Binge, head over to our website, beliefhold.com, and click the Patreon button to sign up for the expansion episodes. And now, my friends, burn some sage and keep the lights low as we explore the dark, magical mystique of the American Southwest in an effort to cast some light on those things kept hidden, shapeshifters and skinwalkers. You. I'm good. Better now with this upbeat music we got for our expansion. Expansion. Feel the hole. Get in the hole. Welcome to the expansion, friends. The expansion of the hole. I'm always excited for expansion episodes because I get to have some beer. Yes. Relax. Expand your mind. Crack a beer with us. Pour a cup of tea. Put on an 80s flick. Well, don't do that because then you'll be after, distracting. After. <laughs> after. But we are back with the expansion just for you, special people who support us to help us keep doing the show. We immensely thank you so much for that. Most definitely. If you, is that even the right way to say that? We immensely thank you? I like that. doesn't sound right. Sounds good. All right. Well, with that bright, upbeat music that we have coming in, leads us perfectly into the feeling of this next topic, Skinwalkers, which <laughs> Not at all. deals with Navajo witchcraft, the potential sacrificing of your loved ones, um, <laughs> curses. Perfect. Demons of the desert. Yes. The Navajo witches. We will probably come up with a new intro for that some point yeah we're we're filling it out yeah the expansion thing is new and for patrons that have been around for a while they've seen our kind of slow drip content that's been on patreon our unicorn episodes thanks for sticking around yeah yeah are off the cuffs but for all you new folks out there this is these expansion episodes are just as full and rich and wonderful as our regular show drops yeah we're not we're not uh cutting any corners out here Mm -mm. and for those of you listeners out there in the strange corners of the southwest if you're traveling for your season of holiday out in that area, this is going to pay attention, pay close attention to this, attention to this part of our episode, because Jeremy's going to get into some, some lore of the region, some magical occulted lore of the Navajo. And if you guys live out or near the res, the Navajo reservation, uh, you should definitely let us know how wrong I am, (laughs) or if you have any stories, because I'm not an expert, obviously. Um, but I've read a lot about this and I've listened to a lot of people and we have some encounters coming up and there's a lot of just, uh, through flow of flow uh, through flow through of, of connective ideas that make this kind of a cohesive, um, mythology because the, the issue with the skinwalkers in the Navajo and in the, you know, surrounding tribal peoples is you can't talk about skinwalkers. This is one of the problems, the secrecy of it. Um, it's like Indian fight club. Yeah. <laughs> the first rule of skinwalkers is no one talks about skinwalkers. Exactly. But, uh, you look into this, and we'll get into some of these encounters and stuff. That we'll actually go into that a little bit. But um, the basic idea is it's of such great evil, this kind of witchcraft. Uh, you don't only bring any attention to it. You can't bring it up. And if also one of the ideas is among the Navajo, from what I've read, is that if you talk about skinwalkers, you can be visited upon in retribution and be hurt, killed, have your family killed, cursed, whatever. Is this just as the Native Americans or is this Yeah, for are we everyone? in danger here or what's going on? We uh, need to bring some sage or something? Sage is the thing. Really? That, which is another interesting aspect to this is that that's a cross-cultural uh, warding off of demon spirits. Um, there's a, uh, I think the tribal person of the Navajo is called the pipe carrier or something like that. That's what it would translate to. And uh, they, in their pipe, they don't smoke the um, fumes, they burn sage with it. And that's used to ward off. Uh, Isn't a sage also like a spiritual leader? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's oh, interesting. weird connections, hmm. guys. <laughs> but yeah, anyways, so if you guys have any experiences, you live out in that area or you know you have a friend of somebody, we'd love to talk to someone about this if they have any encounters, any knowledge of this. Because um, I, what I've done is I've read from a couple books that I've, I've sourced here, got some stories. And of course, um, other people that have dug deeper in this online that are researchers in that area, um, I've referenced to, and we've got some good stories coming up about these encounters. But, um, Jerry, I was going to ask you real quick. It's not just the Navajo, right? There aren't there several tribes 
I actually looked this up because I saw I read conflicting things. Um, I believe that the Cherokee, that maybe the Cheyenne, that the Utes, because right. in, in uh, Utah you have the Utes, and that's surrounding Skinwalker Ranch. Right. Um, but then I've also read where people reference it's it's specifically the Navajo. That's where the lore initially comes from. But then again, you have the crossover of the tribes and the different. And actually, in one of these, um, what I'll read from this book where they actually had someone write in about a Skinwalker when they were trying to do a book on Sasquatch. And uh, they decided to put feelers out on the web on, on their Facebook page and stuff to try to get more Skinwalker stories because they were fascinated by the idea. Yeah, because I think at the time it was kind of a new, it was a new emerging thing online. That's right? the thing because it's such, it's this knowledge has been kept close within the tribe and with with the tribal people. So, because you're not supposed to share with outsiders. Um, that's a very bad form, you know, to do that. And, oh, you asked if this happens to outsiders, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, or if it's just a, a cultural phenomenon within the... The retribution part. The retribution yeah, part. Yeah, that's what we're most concerned about right now. Like talking <laughs> about it. So from what I've actually heard this referenced, uh, that number one, they don't usually appear to people outside of the... Culture? Of the tribe, unless... Usually? Yeah, but there definitely are stories of, of that. If it's you live in the area... Just by talking about them? The retribution of just talking about them, I haven't heard reference to... I think it, it does seem to be, and this is just me talking from what I've read, that retribution, if you talk about it and that kind of thing, if you spread the information to the white man or the outsider, that's when you were visited upon by oh. the curses. Although I did see... We a, did talk about Skinwalker Ranch, so we did a whole episode on it. Right, that. right. Which isn't specifically the same thing, but there it There it were touches Skinwalkers on, on there, though. There, there was. Yeah, we did. And I think in the Dogman episode, we talked about Skinwalkers a little bit. Mm -hmm. but, I'm not um, worried. We didn't know about the curse. Or, but but no, we're I, the white man too. There so was a the Navajo we're not the Navajo passing anything on the Na, There was actually a <laughs> there was actually a like Navajo police or reservation cops yeah. or something. There's a, a TV show and there was a point oh, where, the, yeah. where the cameraman gets cursed because mm -hmm. they're like arresting this one guy. There's this weird like traffic situation. Someone died or got ran over, and the guy's in the back of the cop car and he's like yelling at the cameraman. Three hundred and thirty three. 333 days. So he's like putting a curse on him. Oh. He will die in 333 days. We're not sure what started the fight or who bashed in the windows with the axe. Oh. Unfortunately, the woman is okay. I, I still don't know how she ran herself over. Yuck. All the YouTube comments were like, so did he die? Can we validate you this? check up on that probably. Yeah. But I mean, it's a TV show. Mm -hmm. um, but this is not. This is real. So let's get back into it. <laughs> so yeah, so this all takes place in this general area. And John, for you, you're going to be excited. I have a map. Yay. Maps are back. I have a map. This is just for reference. So this is the area. It's always just for reference. Well, I wanted you to see where this takes place. <laughs> what else place. would it be for? Well, I'm is not- it a decoration? I'm not describing how the Navajo, like the- <laughs> this is set the mood. I'm not describing how like Arizona's know, continent has changed. So if you look at this map, this kind of shows where the, the reservation is, the Navajo Nation. Um, it's This is the Four Corners area. That's always yeah. talked about the cryptid Four Corners. We have all this weird paranormal stuff happening in the, the Four Corners here. It's the Bermuda Triangle of the Southwest. Right. And what it looks like, the Navajo Nation exists at the kind of the north northeast of Phoenix, northwest of Albuquerque, southwest of Colorado, and southeast of Utah, kind of in that, yeah. that corner. You know what's weird about just looking at it? It just looks oddly like a hot spot. No reason why. It just, there's something about well, just looking at that part of the country that just feels like something's going on there. Could yeah. it be that it says Navajo Nation and around it is a red border? No, I just, just <laughs> like the land mass. Like, I don't know. There's something about that part, how far it's from the water. Yeah. Where are you seeing all those other cities? Like, I know all those other cities and they're all have this sort of like Southwest feel and it just has a right. ma magical sort of mysterious yeah. vibe. Yeah. I mean, that's where those, uh, that's where those, um, Quay are that we mentioned in the first really? episode, those wind spirits. Yeah. I thought that was in the Mojave oh, Desert. Oh yeah, that's in the desert. Well, that's in a different, different, different deserty area. Right. Scratch my thought. The, but then I do have a legend about the, the same kind of thing, right? The tornado spirits? Or yeah. The, the, the Chindi. The Chindi. Chindi. But yeah, so you guys may be familiar with skinwalkers like we, we touched on it. We talked about it. Yeah, I say that a lot. We say that so much. Uh, we, we flirted with the topic. No, and touched is fine. <laughs> okay. We flirted, we touched uh, in the Dogman episode. <laughs> we covered it a little bit. And I was always fascinated with this idea. And initially I thought like, because the descriptions are like werewolfish, right? Like you have this man, like bipedal man-shaped kind of creature, usually with a, a wolf or coyote head, dog head. But there's a major distinction between what people would witness as a, as a dog man versus a, a skinwalker, despite the physical characteristics, um, the transformation and where these things come from. So I'm going to read a brief description here about the, uh, and this is corroborated from my other research and from other areas and the book that I'm going to reference later. But this specific reading is just a good summary, and this comes from uh, NavajoLegends.org. The Navajo skinwalker legend is one of the more complex and terrifying stories steeped in mystery and evil intent. 
Many Navajos believe firmly in the existence of skinwalkers and refuse to discuss them publicly for fear of retribution. They believe skinwalkers walk freely among the tribe and secretly transform under the cover of night. The term yi naldushi literally translates to with it he goes on all fours. According to Navajo legend, a skinwalker is a medicine man or witch who has attained the highest level of priesthood in the tribe, but chooses to use his or her power for evil by taking the form of an animal to inflict pain and suffering on others. And this is one thing I heard corroborated by Corey Daniels, who's a researcher. He lives in Arizona, um, but he goes deep into the skinwalker topic and everything. And he had an experience too, where he talked uh, with a local medicine man, an elder, and they were discussing it, which you couldn't discuss, but I guess he owned a gas station. So he would like give away beer to people like just want to hang out. I want to go to that gas station. Well, they asked him like, can we come drink beers with you or whatever? And he's like, yeah. So they came in and then he's like, do you guys hear about like, what is this deal with skinwalkers? And this was like, I guess a couple decades ago in the nineties and the medicine man or the elder was like, well, we, we're not supposed to say, but we'll tell you since you're one of us now you've shared with us, but never ask me again. And then he goes on to describe the skinwalker. And But the interesting thing that correlates here is once a person is trained to a certain level, they have the option to choose light or dark. And it's not like they're given necessarily like, now, would you like to go and be part of the, the dark side or are you going to join the force? You know, it's like basically there's a, it comes to a certain point of enlightenment in this craft where you can be pulled in the direction of evil. And at that point, the medicine man or the elder will just wash their hands of you. Oh. So instead of trying to turn you off from the dark side, it's almost like a balance kind of thing. Like they let it happen, but they step back. Right. They don't stop them, but then they, but they have to remove themselves from this person because they're wow. going to go dark. What do you mean a balance? In other words, they could take their pupil and they could say, young Padawan, you must stay with the light. Right. But instead... It may they, be like a balance between dark and light. Like some of them have to go to the dark side. Yeah. Like it almost seems like a... Like, like when you're picking teams. Right. But instead of picking, they let it play out. Right. But I mean like a balance as far as people Some, that join both sides, dark and light, like there yeah. has to be. Yeah. On different sides. Yeah. yeah it's that's like, weird. It sounds like there's some sort of invisible force that is all aware of this sort of progress of these different people becoming enlightened into this uh, craft or whatever. And then that awareness will pull people in different directions to keep the balance of the dark and the light. Right. But right. what's interesting is this witchcraft, this sorcery of uh, skin walking, if you will, this wasn't always a thing apparently with the Navajo according to what I've read about it in their teachings. The reason that it started, supposedly, was because during the time of Spanish conquest and Europeans coming in and the pain and suffering they had to go through, they were given the gift, is what their lore kind of talks about. Interesting. And I'll read it. There'll be a clip I'll read of that in a moment. But um, And this is where it gets kind of creepy. This is the dark side of what you must do to become the skinwalker. skinwalker. <laughs> to become a skinwalker requires the most evil of deeds, the killing of a close family member. They literally become humans who have acquired immense supernatural power, including the ability to transform into animals and other people. According to the Navajo skinwalker legend, these evil witches are typically seen in the form of a coyote, owl, fox, wolf, or crow, although they do have the ability to turn into any animal they choose. Because it is believed that skinwalkers wear the skins of the animals they transform into, it is considered taboo to wear the pelt of any animal. In fact, the Navajo are only known to wear two hides, sheepskin and buckskin, both of which are only used for ceremonial purposes. And I've heard that. That's interesting. I've heard sheepskin and cowhide, and it's because those are animals that the skinwalker won't shapeshift into. Oh, wow. That's yeah. why they're allowed to wear those. Because they're not very ferocious as a deer or a sheep. Yeah. Although you could be a wolf in sheep's clothing. That seems like it'd be handy. Um, <laughs> those who have talked of their encounters with these evil beings, some of this might sound familiar describe a number of ways in which a skinwalker will try to inflict harm. Some describe hearing knocks on the window or banging on the walls. Oh. Others have spotted an animal-like figure peering in through a window. According to Navajo skinwalker legend, they are seldom caught. Those who do track a skinwalker and learn of their true identity must pronounce the name of the evil one in full. Rumpelstiltskin? <laughs> Once this happens, the skinwalker will get sick or die for the wrongs they have inflicted against others. Interesting. That sounds like dogma to me, that like knocking on the window. Exactly. And that's the idea to inflict fear. And a lot of these stories, there isn't a direct attack, but there's this prolonged uh, intention, it seems like, to draw out the most fear possible, the yeah. kind of feeding off that negative energy. I just want to say something real quick, because this is reminding me of, have you ever seen like the, the haunting series? on Amazon. I'm I think it's sure. probably on Netflix too. I sent you one of oh, them. Oh, I did. I watched, I think, the the one. Was that the one where it was like really compelling, but it was almost too good at times? Yeah, it was like super cinematic. Yeah. Well, I watched another one that was fairly recent and uh, it was it was really freaky. The place was like 
It was a house, but it was this very large, old, old house. And there, I don't know, I guess this, I don't know what triggered that, but the episode that I saw, um, it started to get pretty intense and like the walls were talking and stuff. And like- the Walls half, were talking? Yeah, like and growling and stuff. And like people were just like freaking out. And like the sound guy was just like, I'm done, man. Like I'm, I'm, wow. I'm out. I, like, yeah, because he's I hearing it the most, right? Sound and this is not what I want to do. And he's like, do you want the shirt back? And he's like, no, no, that's okay, you know? And then like three other and people quit up? right after that. It didn't seem like a setup. No, it did really, like this guy was terrified. Really? Terrified out of his mind. But it was right after like the walls started growling. And it was just like, I mean, I, in the way that that place was set up, I think something when you talked about seeing an animal in the window or knocking on the walls, like it's fun to talk about it. But like when you're actually in that oh, right. space, I've had little experiences with this being in that insane asylum and having that just pure fear. S- yeah. Primal fear. Like it's just, you can't stop it. Yeah. And like to be in a situation like that, where you're really confronted with something evil and not of this world, like you can't define it. It's, it's such a primal fear. It's like, being behind an alligator and you realize there's this right. thing that could just shred you to pieces right behind you. But it'd be like an alligator that like was enjoying each or some yeah. fear. Well, even probably even worse, except, you know, obviously alligators are physical. So the chances of them hurting you are higher. But skinwalkers are physical because in what you're describing. Oh, right, right. Yeah. What you're describing is a, a lot of these stories. And actually uh, in the clip that I'll play later, he makes an interesting point where he had like a Bigfoot encounter before because he lives out in Utah. Um, but he lives in the four corners, but at some point he had a Bigfoot encounter. He was really excited when he saw it. Cause you know, it was like this thing of lore that he's heard people in the area mm-hmm. talk about. But when he saw this thing that he never thought existed, it was like, he sensed pure evil. It was, mm-hmm. it was, you know, you, you can see something paranormal, strange, uh, like a creature like Bigfoot, but when, but there are things with these, especially dogmen type creatures and especially skinwalkers where there is this feeling of pure dread and terror. Like it emanates evil. Something's wrong. Right. You know? Yeah. And it enjoys being... It enjoys suffering and pain and probably terrifying people. It enjoys that fear. And that's, you know, I think that's maybe what sparked that image is these people are in this house and the demon that was haunting it was just straight, pure evil. It hated people. It hates, it yeah. wants to hurt. Like it's not just some benign ethereal figure. Right. Like its goal is to terrify people and and do everything it can to manifest enough power to actually like throw a knife or... That's always the scariest part to me in those stories is the... Not even like the physical attack of like a poltergeist phenomena where something gets thrown at you. That's scary, especially if it's a blade or something. But it's the idea that like the thing can take you over and make you the instrument of death. Like there, there's some crazy stories out there that hopefully we get to cover down the road that have a lot of a lot of history and research to back it up where there are accounts of these things slowly building in people's homes over the years where the person becomes homicidal. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Think about Luigi like Amityville stories. Horror. Or- mm-hmm. Sally House. The Shining. The Shining. But that's the difference with these entities too, like that fear between the alligator and the that house or the skinwalker. It's the difference to me of like, if someone breaks into your house with a knife and he's looking for, maybe he's angry and mm-hmm. wants to hurt you or he wants to steal from you versus the guy that comes in smiling with a knife, enjoying yeah. the terror and the sadistic nature of mm-hmm. it. The sadistic nature is what we see from these, some of these entities, these darker entities. Mm-hmm. And it makes sense with the, the witchcraft that comes with the uh, the skinwalker, yeah, they are they're feeding on that darkness. But um, but yeah. So let's well let's continue here. Uh, oh, and I did mention sage is a good tool. Mm-hmm. Uh, with the uh, the pipe carrier for the uh, the Navajo, and they use a ceremonial pipe called a calumet to burn sage for protection against witches. So it is weird how that is cross um, cultural. Yeah, you can get sage anywhere. So go out and get some guys. I would recommend it. <laughs> this house has been blessed, so we should be good here. Yeah, and you're like oh, 30, that's right. It actually has 30 yeah. feet from a church. I can see. I that. know. I'm pretty safe here. Although, where is the graveyard? I don't bum, see one bum, out the window. Bum. It's under the house. <laughs> I don't know. No, I would have definitely felt something by now. All right. So, why the secrecy? Right. We kind of touched on that a little bit. And to get into kind of that idea, I want to talk about one of the books that I found that um, actually had good reviews on Kindle, which is hard to find. Yeah, I read sections of this book and I thought it was really well done. It's called uh, Skinwalkers, Shapeshifters, and Native American Curses. Now, this was written by a couple. Couple of people? Couple of folks, guy and gal. Um, but they, they initially lived in Oregon where they had experienced some uh, Sasquatch encounters, it sounded like. They've heard stories of it. Maybe they hadn't witnessed themselves, but they've heard a lot of stories. Uh, and so then they moved to Utah and they were collecting stories. And that's when I mentioned they sent out the call for Sasquatch stories and they got the Skinwalker story. So they- What are their names? 
Uh, it is Gary and Wendy Swanson. <gasps> Wendy Swanson, dude. I just saw that in a movie. Really? Yeah. The name? N- Wendy Swanson. What was that? Synchronicity. And I don't ever watch movies. It was literally like within the last week. Oh my God, that's weird. That is weird. Synchronicities, man. Yeah. Anywho. Okay, so yeah, once they once they got that first report of the Skinwalker, not having really heard of it before, they were like, oh, this sounds interesting. Let's put a call out for more stories. Then they got another story. And then they're like, okay, let's do some research to validate this. Okay, so this comes, this, I'm going to jump into the beginning of their book here. This outlines some of the secrecy involved around it. We contacted a friend who is a healer or medicine man within the Comanche Nation of the Great Plains. His wife is a member of one of the Apache tribes. We enlisted his help in our quest to understand the Skinwalker. Although our friend understood a lot about this demon, he explained that his involvement might somehow give this cunning witch an open door to cause harm to the Plains tribes, which up until now have been unaffected by these evil creatures that seemed concentrated within the Southwestern and Mexican native tribes. So see where it's specific for those tribes right. and others don't want to involve themselves because yeah. they don't want it to spread. It's like a disease. Exactly. Therefore, he introduced us by telephone to another source who was from a tribe that is all too familiar with these witches. He took particular care to remain anonymous and we thank our friend for his help in making this contact who turned out to be an unequivocal authority on these terrible beings. We met with our source after a journey into Navajo or Diné country. We inquired after introductions as to the reason for so much secrecy. The elderly gentleman guardedly informed us that this creature was, quote, proprietary information and not told to non Dine or Navajo because the mere mention of the Yi Nalushi, or Navajo for Skinwalker, may invite the attention of one. He did make some notes on our notepad for us to read and memorize without ever speaking them aloud. And then he took the pages and burned them with his wood stuff while we made our own notes using our personal brand of shorthand based on what he had written. No words were spoken for many long minutes. This really impressed upon us that what we were discovering was an extremely evil entity that does truly exist. So, I mean, this is part of the theme that, like, they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to be heard talking about it because it can exact retribution. Um, And that's a theme that goes out all throughout this continent. You know, in South America, you hear about the witches down there where you can't even mention their name in public. Oh, the Bruja. people get upset. I forget the name of the witch that we... When like we were they in Costa don't Rica, want to attract attention. You don't talk about it. You don't talk about it. You don't say the name. Right. Um, yeah, because it like, gives it power. Yeah. Candyman, uh, Candyman. Don't do it. Not in here. <laughs> don't you have to spin in a circle or something? Bloody uh, Mary? I'm pretty That's sure. Bloody Mary. Yeah, Candyman I think is totally fictional. You right? said it the third time? Oh, no! Sorry, John. It has to be in succession. Okay. <laughs> it's like Beetlejuice. So there was another... Uh, later on, they talk about in the book how they meet with another individual actually in Navajo country, and they meet at an outdoor patio, and it's it's fairly secluded, so they can't, they're thinking no one can hear them. But as he's talking, the man's talking to him, he's an older gentleman um, who was apparently in World War II, and during during mid-sentence talking about skinwalkers, he starts talking about his time being uh, in World War II as a Navajo code talker. And oh, getting, cool. And they look at him- Wind talker? Yeah. Um, and they, they look at him strangely- because he just shifted gears, and then he, Wendy looks up at what he's looking at in the tree, and it's a raven, and that's why he changed his... Oh, and, weird. And then, and then after it left, then he started talking about skinwalkers again, and then he stopped again, and there was this weird-looking squirrel with, like, feet that were too big for its body. And this is another thing you hear, this, like, misshapen, not-quite-right kind of thing where, you know, the shapeshifter doesn't always get it quite right, or right. it's in the middle of transition. But that was just kind of an interesting anecdote in that yeah. story. Uh, but we'll have a link to that book. It's really interesting. Okay, so where do the powers come from? Um, this comes from their book. So after they're discussing with the gentleman I was telling you about, the pipe carrier, he mentions that this power essentially was given to them by the gods at a time of great need. Quote, this capability enabled the shapeshifters to sneak into the camps of the Spanish invaders who came north to capture slaves to work in their silver and gold mines in Mexico. Then upon returning to their tribes, they would change back into their human form once more and warn their people of what they had observed. The skinwalker is also possessed with the ability to make people do things, to hurt or even kill themselves. Somehow our friend explained, some of these witches turned from protectors of the Dine and instead began to use their powers for evil and destructive purposes. We learned that not all witches are skinwalkers, but that all skinwalkers are witches. We were told that to become a skinwalker, one must kill a sibling or other close relative. We also learned that the motivation for a person to become a skinwalker was often driven by greed or a desire for another person's possessions or money. 
So what started as a witch to protect their people also had the ability to conduct wicked acts. After our studies, we admittedly cannot see anything but destructive abuse of these powers in today's skinwalkers. So anytime you hear about skinwalkers today, it's obviously, it's all, it's not friendly shape-shifting for benevolent right. reasons. It's, it's usually starts from supposedly some, some greed, some jealousy, some darkness, the worst dark Envy, parts of yeah. humanity that just fester in you. You're like, I want, I want that. I will kill for it. I will kill a family member. And then you're given this supposed gift, this dark gift. Evil seed is born in like that sort of envious greed. Exactly. Well, yeah. it's interesting. And then it probably metastasizes. Yeah. And then grows. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because you said, you know, this was a, this was a, an ability that was given to them at some point when they, in great, when they were in great need. Right. And then eventually became corrupted. And now that's sort of always a dark sort of situation, but it's interesting because even though for the Navajo community, it might've been a new thing there. This is a phenomenon that's global. Africa, South America, you have sham stories of shamans shape-shifting across the globe. You know, separated by oceans, you have these stories throughout millennia. Even like some of the earliest cave paintings, you see what are now um, thought to be depictions of shamans in different transformations forms. of form. So it's interesting to think maybe this in different parts of the world, this was going on in antiquity. And then more recently when it was needed, it was a gift given to the Navajo on this continent. It's just an interesting idea. But it's interesting that the gods or whoever, or however they got this gift, would. It's I guess it sounds kind of familiar, the idea of the ambivalence sometimes of these high, other entities, higher entities giving a gift and then letting it go. Right. You know, um, and then, and then it, good luck. Yeah. Do what you will. With great power comes great responsibility. Spider-Man. Oh, is that from Spider-Man? I mean, it probably came from somewhere else. It before, rings but. true. <laughs> um, well, I've got a, uh, one solid story from that book that was pretty interesting. Kind of gives a, an overview of uh, a possible ceremony of the skinwalker. Let's do it. And then, uh, and then after that, we can take a break, come back, and then do, get into an actual encounter that someone had, and then a couple more really good stories. Sure. Okay, so this comes from that same book. What's the book called again? Skinwalkers, Shapeshifters, and Native American Curses. And we'll have it linked in the show notes. If you got Kindle, you can download it. <clears throat> we should probably be an affiliate. <laughs> okay, so uh, this takes place in the Badlands of South Dakota. So it begins with basically these kids that are on a camping trip, and they start hearing gunfire and other and drumming sounds and so they go to like investigate and it's kind of like young kids exploring and that idea of let's find out let's be like uh scouts you know back in the day so this is after they've gotten on top of the hill and they're looking down at what was making all the sound there below us was a large fire comprised of what looked like wooden freight boxes and some old automobile tires there were eight native men dressed in what looked like to be shaggy clothes of some animal skins that were grayish like coyotes they were all drinking beer and whiskey and were barely able to stand up as they danced around the fire chanting some kind of strange rhythmic words that we could not recognize except for the occasional words in Lakota that came through. They kept dancing and chanting for several long minutes and then suddenly they all sat down. The drummer put down his drum and he too sat down. Everything became absolutely quiet and then from behind a parked vehicle that was in back of the nearest dune a man dressed entirely in a robe of skins that appeared to be coyote slowly approached the fire. And as he made his way in front of each man, he made eye contact with each one in turn. After he had silently made eye contact with all present, he approached the group again and stopped before one of them and placed his hand on the man's shoulder. The chosen one seemed reluctant to have been selected, and he looked around at his companions as if for support, but then he seemed to accept being selected. It was then that the newcomer removed his robes of animal skins and placed them around the chosen candidate. Then, small drums were handed to each participant, and as we stared and were straining to hear, a steady beating of drums accompanied by a strange chanting that became almost hypnotizing began slowly and gradually increasing in intensity. And the robed man was escorted to the center of the ring, and he began to dance as the others beat their drums with increased speed. As the chanting grew louder until it reached an almost fanatical point, the newcomer threw a powdery substance into the fire, and there was a huge flash accompanied by a great cloud of dark smoke that gathered the entire area. When the smoke began to dissipate, the chosen man had disappeared, and there in his place stood a small deer fawn, which could barely stand. It appeared to be drugged, and as it wobbled in confusion, the newcomer promptly removed a pistol from his pocket and put it in the fawn's eye and pulled the trigger. The poor animal died instantly. The shock of it all confused and frightened me badly. My friends and I decided it was time to leave. We all met on the backside of the hill and made our way back to our own camp so fast, 
It was as though we knew that something was after us. None of us uttered so much as a single word as we returned to our camp, as though the devil himself was chasing us. None of us could sleep, so we huddled under our blankets and tarps until dawn broke. As the first sight of light touched the sky, we quickly broke camp, and it was only then that we began to discuss what we had seen. It was like we hadn't dared to speak of what we had seen until daylight, for fear of the darkness shouting out our presence. Kind of reminds me of that story of the Duncans. Oh, when they're stuck in the car because yeah. they're scared. I just can't move. Yeah, oh, that was the Halloween episode, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was that was a freaky story. Yeah, when when it's that close to something traumatic like that, it's like you you can't even talk about it yet. It's just still like you don't want to draw any, right any attention or exactly, anything. Yeah, yeah, you just freeze. It reminds me of when you have a, a terrifying experience in the at night, or even like I mean, is, even though this isn't a supernatural, even like a terrible nightmare that feels so real. When you're younger and you you wake up from it and you don't want to tell someone what you felt because you feel like it's drawing back in that darkness. Right. You know, bringing it to light. Well, the guy, uh, so he's a kid at this time and he asks his dad about it. And obviously the friends want to know what's going on. And he gives him like a, basically like an explanation for kids. Like it, it was a ceremony, you know, yeah, the, the deer was shot, but it's not illegal. It's, you know, their practice and everything. Um, practice, pistol in the eye. <laughs> It's hunting practice. Well, it's ceremonial practice, right? Uh, like, um, like a sacrifice, right? Uh, and he, so he didn't want to scare them. But then years later, as the boy got older, became an adult, he asked his dad. We were fishing on our favorite lake, and we sat watching our bobbers. I looked over at Dad, and I said something like, "Dad, I'm an adult now, so don't you think you could finally tell me the truth about that killing I saw in the Badlands?" Dad met my eyes, laid down his fishing pole, and slowly and deliberately took out a cigarette, lit it. And after a deep drag, he exhaled forcefully and answered. He said he was sorry he had to lie to me, but it was for our family's safety and also for the safety of my friends' families. He said that he had always felt that I didn't believe him, and he very much appreciated my not pressing the issue before now. He told me that what we had witnessed was an evil ceremony by a group of tribal members called Skinwalkers. They are a small group of witches that became that way by the most terrible means, of which I will not describe. He went on to explain that the skinwalker witch has the ability to assume the physical body of another creature, and this is called shape-shifting. The skinwalker that we had observed that evening was a man who had done many very evil acts that were considered too evil for even his fellow witches, and they planned to get rid of him. Dad said the man probably had no idea what was coming that night until the man that was wearing the coyote skins entered the camp. He must have suddenly realized that he was about to die, and when the others combined their powers, they overrode his strength, and they used the shapeshifter evil to turn him into a young deer. Dad stressed that what I saw was the killing of a deer and not a human. Because of this, no crime was committed other than the shooting of a deer, which is perfectly legal on the reservation. Dad apologized for not telling me sooner, but that he concealed the truth to prevent me from ever mentioning the incident to another soul, as we Native Americans are always concerned about being overheard by a wandering skinwalker. They are very real and extremely evil. When I followed up with the logic that since the man was turned into a deer, the man was also killed, Dad merely replied, who knows where the man went. My father has passed away now and I feel I must finally relieve my conscience of this burden. I've had to live with this hideous memory for way too long after I witnessed the murder. Simply telling about this makes me feel better, but I still have not told my old friends about this truly frightening experience. And that comes from JJ Chavez, Rapid City, South Dakota. Oh, that's pretty intense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting too because from what you said earlier, the two the two animals that they don't normally shape shift into at will, at least, is a sheep and a deer, right? But in this situation, another witch or another skinwalker transforms the even evil or witch, right, into the one of the wonder, two things that they normally wouldn't transform into a deer. So he could be vulnerable. So he could be vulnerable. I wonder and take if they. They did that because, like, if you go too far, the chances of actually being discovered or yeah. rooted out go up. Yeah, or it's interesting, too. Like, maybe they go rogue. Yeah, like maybe they start coming after other skinwalkers. Right. It's funny because before... You kind of blow the cover if you just become too egotistical and probably start doing things right. that are outside the yeah. code of conduct. He was the Jeffrey Epstein of the skinwalkers. <laughs> had to be. He was the scapegoat or the it, it, scape deer. It's interesting, uh, though... Escape deer. Uh, before you got into this aspect of the research, I always thought when I heard about skinwalkers, I knew that they were uh, allegedly Native American witches, like dark witches. But I always thought that they were solitary. I didn't know that they that they had like a group where they would get together in these sort of Native American versions of covens, you know, and 
where yeah. there's a there's a community of skinwalkers. Well, I always thought it was solitary. Maybe it varies. You know, yeah. maybe, maybe they're a pack of skinwalkers. They rove in packs, mm-hmm. potentially. You know, I'm sure there might be individuals freaky too. though. Like I can oh, yeah. just kind of all these visuals are coming into my head about like just being in that space where everything is so raw, raw. You yeah. know, everything is very grounded in the rawness of their natural surroundings, yeah. and then having that on the backdrop of like the ethereal world is pretty intense. Oh yeah. I think that's why their, their magic and their lore. And, you know, they've tried to preserve that. It seems like speaking as an outsider, yeah, you, know, you that, know, a lot. Yeah, I know a lot. Right? <laughs> um, but they obviously have that like, and to, to not get too into like the fantasy side of it, like, and you know, um, it's interesting because, uh, the, uh, you know, JK Rowling, that movie she came out with, you know, the Harry she, Potter, she wrote Harry Potter. Mm-hmm. Well, she wrote a, uh, book that became a movie or the screenplay for a movie called Fantastic Beasts. Oh yeah, yeah. And I tried to watch on HBO and I couldn't. couldn't Did you? It was just, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's great. I well, just, it's interesting because it goes into this idea of like, you know, we, how we think about sometimes Native Americans and like, it, it almost, almost like, they almost depict them sometimes as like fantasy. Right. And, Stereotypes. Uh, and it's interesting because there was some controversy because when he was, she was coming out with Fantastic Beasts, leading up to that film, she published some uh, pseudo histories quote that combine existing people, events, and legends. Uh, the Navajo tribe, shape-shifting skinwalkers, the Salem witch trials, um, with the mythology of the Harry Potter world. And she called Weird. she called this the history of magic in North America. Oh, interesting. And so the short stories, fictionalized versions of this real culture and history. So she got called out, obviously, because these are people that have like real beliefs. Oh, and right. some of the stuff, skinwalkers, you can't, you're not supposed to talk about. This knowledge isn't supposed to be shared. So well, are we going to get yelled at by Well, we're, we're talking about it like with, we're not creating a fictionalized history. That's here, true. You know, um. So, but probably, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, freedom of speech. Right. But I mean, I think that the point was like taking that, the very little of what they have left of the culture and then fictionalizing it, twisting it and not, not writing clearly like. Bastardizing the culture for her own fictional accounts, basically. Right. So, uh, Adrian Keene, um, a Cherokee anthropologist, uh, she said in response to that, and she, I think she was Cherokee. Uh, she said, Rowling is completely rewriting these traditions, traditions that come from a particular context, place, understanding, and truth. What happens when Rowling puts this in is we as Native people are now opened up to a barrage of questions about these beliefs and traditions, but these are not things that need or should be discussed by outsiders. Um, And then another guy, Brian Young, a Navajo author, accused Rowling of turning Native Americans into a fantasy quote and aggravating racial tensions in the U.S. by promoting stereotypes. But the interesting part to me that specifically is how they describe it as truth, like, you know, the skinwalkers, these beliefs, they don't look at it as fantasy or, you know, it's, it's very real to these people and even to the, you know, non-natives that live in the area that have experienced right. stuff. Well, it's the, I, I totally, like, I understand that part of it. Like, you know, you treat, so, you take something and you make it your own fictional thing. You don't respect the origins of what, what they believe and could very well be actual dark forces. And you, but isn't that kind of just the history of everything? Like people take from different things and create their yeah. own. It reminds me of what you're saying. It reminds me of like if there was a true haunting, right? A true story with like uh, vivid accounts that people really experienced uh, or something that was very vivid, real, maybe somewhat supernatural. And then someone writes like a, a science fiction story about it. And then, you know, whether intentional or not, people look back. For instance, anything we talk about conspiratorial, you're like, oh yeah, that was on TV. That's not real. It makes right. it, yeah, it's like Lucifer, that TV show. Like, oh, it's just fun. It's just the devil yeah, on it, TV. It, yeah, any kind of- you're making light of, of like a belief that you're like, it's all fantasy. And it's sexy. Right. And it's right. sexy. Yeah. And it kind of belittles the, the real, yeah, potential reality. That is, unfortunately, that is the reality we live in. We have to- you know, right. but I can understand what, what they're saying too, yeah. because like they, first of all, you know, they never agreed to be part of the culture to begin with. Right. So that was kind of stolen, but yeah. No, I agree. Like, I mean, I everyone's think it's fair culture to is sort of being pulled and made Yeah. And I totally own. think that that's fine and fair, but it always, but it does, it always, I think it's an, even as an accidental consequence, it bugs me when stuff like the paranormal conspiracy get pulled into these fictionalized versions. It gets versions. Disney-fied. Yeah, and you get shows like Supernatural and then everything. Oh, yeah, I saw that on TV. Well, it's it's not real because it was on TV. Yeah, you know well, that's what I mean? all part of purpose. It's just part of the world we live in. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Um, it's interesting to hear from that side. But yeah, well, let's. you guys want to take a break? We can come back and actually play a clip of an encounter. Let's do it. Followed by a couple more stories. Sounds good. Groovy.
And we're back. Welcome back, guys. All right, getting back into it, we have a real clip for you guys. This comes from um, a really good, uh, it's a YouTube channel, might be a podcast too, called uh, Crypto PTSD. Oh. Um, done really well. And uh, we'll link to it in the show notes. Um, and I'm going to just, to give you a brief intro to what's happening here, um, I didn't catch this guy's profession, but he's called to do a job up by the Canadian River. He lives in, uh, I think, Utah or South Dakota. I think he says in the story here, but... Um, uh, but he gets called away about 60 miles to do this thing in this really creepy area for this job. He goes there, leaves his tools, and then starts heading back. And the encounter happens about 20 miles from his home. He goes back to get his tools? No, he went He went up and left his tools at the job site and then is heading home for okay. the day. And he's about 20 miles from home. And this is how the story begins. And I was coming up to, uh, I was on top of a hill. And, and it curves down into a uh, creek bottom. Well, just as I got to the top of the hill, there was this car coming at me. It was just flying. I mean, it was had to have been doing at least 85. And I thought, what in the world are they driving so fast? There's a lot of deer in that country. And you just see dead deer on the road all the time. So, but they were flying, and I, th- I thought that was odd. But But as I was coming down the hill... Uh, my lights hit something on the on the side of the road. You know, it couldn't have been five, six, seven feet off the road, and I couldn't figure out what this thing was. It was bright. It was light color, um, and then I realized this thing is standing up. It's bipedal. Well, I started slowing down because I was afraid whatever it was would run out in front of the road and you know might hit it. So I was slowing down pretty fast, and I've got. LED lights on my pickup and uh, I've got a late model Chevy and the lights are very bright on it and uh, once I got close enough I started realizing this thing doesn't look normal you know it's it's just built funny but it was still something standing up and uh, closer I got I finally realized that this thing's got a coyote head and because that really kind of shook me and I just started really hitting the brakes because you know I just knew this thing was going to run out in front of me I'm getting pretty slow and then once I was getting up where I could see I thought okay this it's got a coyote head and this thing's got shoulders like a human and arms that hanging out down the side and it's bright silvery almost white with my lights reflecting off it and the, the grass it was standing in is, is called silver tip blue stem and it just reflects light because I so I could see this thing very clearly and but I noticed coming down the hill that it was looking up at the hill at me and the the closer I got it just followed the vehicle but once I got real close this thing was staring into the window at me and but you could just feel a sense of evil just you know it just was not right it just overwhelmed, you know, just, I just couldn't believe what I seen. And uh, so I just rolled by pretty slow and looked at it. It was looking right at me, just looked right in my eyes. And it was as if it was saying, I, I know who you are and where you're at. And it was just, I've never had an encounter like this. The first Bigfoot I saw, I was excited. I jumped out of the pickup and you know, went, went to look at it and, and stopped once I kind of caught myself. But, you know, I'd, I'd known they had been around for years. And I finally see one and I was excited. But you know, this thing just shook me to my soul because it just it just wasn't right. I mean, this, this thing standing there just didn't look right. So as I went on by, I, it bothered me so bad. I turned on my... Uh, LED lights on my back of my flatbed trailer just to make sure it did not jump up on there. I was afraid I would take it home with me. <laughs> well, for two or three days, I just was in complete denial of what I would seen. Um, I kept thinking, okay, it had to have been something that fell off somebody's vehicle. 
uh, back deck of back of trailer, or it was a tree stump, or you know, I was trying to search for anything else than what I thought I saw, and and that I got called out. Oh, sorry, my hands are shaking. <laughs> so I'm rattling the phone. Uh, I got called out two or three days later to go right back up there, but it was during the daytime, and I wanted to stop and get out and look for, you know to see if I could see tracks or see what what this was or see if, if any sign of something falling off and gouging up dirt or grass or, you know, just anything, any, trying to ration this thing out. <clears throat> well, I get up there. I, I got my pistol out. I wasn't going to get out without it. And I walked over to where I saw it, and I could not find any tracks. The grass was not disturbed except right where that spot was. There was nothing else in that whole area that would even account for what I, I saw. Now, I'm, my great-grandmother is, is full-blood Cherokee, and I've always heard the, you know, the skinwalkers, the shapeshifters, and I always thought that was myth, you know, legend, fable. And smoked too much peyote or stayed in the sweat lodge too long. I just didn't think they were real, but, but, you know, I was 20 feet from this thing, and it was pretty obvious what it was. There's just no doubt. Crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, it's just, it's just, it just makes you think, like, what else is out there? Yeah. It's funny, because, like, it, it, he, it's one of these... He's one of these witnesses when he recounts it, it sounds like he's remembering it as he recounts it. Yeah. You know, but I always do get like a red flag when I hear someone talking about an experience and they're like, but the t- first time I saw a Bigfoot, like a separate sort of creature, right. like what are, what are the universal, you know, rolls of dice that he's seeing these things? Or maybe it happens to some people more where they see more things than and some people never well, see especially anything. Especially when you're living in these areas, I think that's definitely possible. It's going to yeah. be more remote. And um, yeah, and on that note, if you want to jump to the next clip, it, it talks about this. So we have a sketch here, guys. This is an artist rendering that he actually worked with a sketch artist to develop. And we're, the clip's going to play that right now. Oh, that's an awesome picture. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the, the way he describes it, the bizarre things about this image, it looks like a man covered in fur with a, a coyote head all in white. And the odd thing is like, you know, dog men you hear, they're like werewolfy. They got their arms out in front, whatever. This thing, They're always built, They're always jacked. They're always jacked and muscular. This thing is specifically not. It's its arms it's are straight. It's like a, just a coyote, a coyote standing up almost. Yeah, but with like human, long human arms. Right. Without, yeah, but you know, coyotes are pretty skinny. They're not right. bulky yeah. animals. But instead of having the barrel chest like the coyote it has, like they have a square flat f- chest. Yeah, yeah um, you're right. It doesn't have that weird bend in the arm that dogs do. Puppy the, knees, as we talked about on our dog man. No so. puppy knees. <laughs> Do- doggy knees. But the weird thing is he described to the sketch artist is the the separation from the arms from the chest, how there's like that space and the, oh, weird, yeah. the kind of uprise in the shoulders that this thing has. Uh, this, I can see why someone might say that's a shapeshifter because it looks like it's not completely like a normal structure. Yeah. Of a, well, what's funny to think about it though, like, sorry. Oh, go ahead. It's good. Um, just the thought of that, like running around in the wilderness mm-hmm. when there's nothing around, but it's a shapeshifter. Yeah. Like what, like insanity is that? Like, what is it doing? Yeah, st- and staring at you as you drive by. Yeah. And like, by the way, being seven and a half to eight and a half feet tall. It's just out in the middle of nowhere doing it. Like, because, you know, if it is a shapeshifter, it has intelligence like a human. Right. Like, or more. Yeah, because it on, is a human. Like, right. Initial, so what's yeah. his business out there? Yeah, so what the hell is he just doing out there? Just like an insane Scaring wolf people? just yeah. running out. Yeah, just it, it just reminds you of primal again, that just sort of primal. Hunting like, fear. Like what, there's this underlying... You know, it makes me just think about how far we've come in the last like hundred years, how we're, we're only a couple generations away from just like insanity, like so connected with oh, right. the rawness of reality. Yeah. Where now everything's comfortable and plugged like we, in, separated from electricity. electricity. Yeah. But back, you know, there's, is that primal sort of thing. Again. Yeah. Yeah. These things are living in that for sure. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's part of what gives them the power potentially. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, if you want to jump to the next clip, this describes his, it goes back into that idea of it following you in your dreams. And we hear this with the dog man, that sense of malevolence and evil that just like penetrates you and you have nightmares and trauma. That's why this, I think this channel is about skinwalkers and dog men and it's called crypto PTSD because all these encounters, a lot of them are like people that are trying to get through this therapeutically. Oh yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it's, it reminds me of um, dog man encounters with 
uh, Vic Cundiff. Vic Cundiff. Mm-hmm. I've, I mean, almost all the callers on, or a lot of the callers on there sound just like they've been devastated. Oh, yeah. I love that one we played for our Dogman episode where it's it's oh, yeah. taken from that show and it's like you can hear his voice shaking. But yeah, let's no, play. God, it was awful. And he reached in the window. Vic. He reached in the window. Yeah, so visceral. Him, no, just, but you can hear his yeah. like, yeah, it's terror. But yeah, let's roll the next clip here. And I saw his teeth and smelled like flesh. You know, this this really bothered me. And, and in fact, at night, I, I couldn't sleep. When I'd fall asleep, I would get a vision of this thing. You know, I could see it standing, looking at me. And so for two months, I didn't didn't sleep much. Still in denial of what I was saying, but I thought, you know, maybe if I have somebody draw this thing out for me, just go through the process and and try to figure out if this would help. But she did the sketch for me, and she just did a fantastic job. She just pretty much nailed it. You know, I went through the process of the sketch, which it took, oh, it probably went a week and a half, two weeks, I guess. She'd do some drawing, and then she'd send me a picture of it, and then we'd make the changes. And, and you know, she took her time, and she told me to take my time, and she wanted it right. It just got to where she asked me to uh, to write it out, just write the whole story out on paper. And uh, she was on the phone with me while I was doing it. And, you know, it just, as if I was so focused in on doing that and, and the remembering of what was going on, it was almost like a flashback. It just so powerful. But it was as if this thing was coming in at me. And I stopped at one point and told Sibylla, I said, this thing's standing out front of the house. And she said, what? I said, I can feel it. I can tell you where it's standing. I can tell you which way it's looking. And <sighs> this has been over a year ago. It's still affecting me this way. And uh, she said, are you sure it's just not going where you're living? And I said, no, it's overwhelming. The, feel- the feeling is coming from my front yard. Uh, it's the encounter. I was just shaking so bad. I couldn't, I couldn't think straight. Uh, I just didn't want him to think about it. Just kind of like the Indians say, don't say his name or, you know, you know, call it to you. And so I waited till the next afternoon and, and finished it. Yeah. So that idea that it's like, it's so penetrating and pervasive in your, in your, uh, the traumatic memory that you you feel it, it like the flashback he had you know just just trying to recall the whole story and writing it out just like he felt like it was visiting him again that right. idea of like talking about it coming back well, it's evil i mean like that's what these things are they're not friendly like mystical creatures apparently you know these these are bad creatures they're demons essentially i mean they're not it doesn't seem like they're demons but they're all along the lines yeah. right well if if the legend holds true with the the Navajo folklore you have to kill a family member in order yeah, to gain this power it they're comes from darkness they're born from blood right you know they're born out of like darkness so like if these things it sounds like a, almost like a like a poltergeist if it attaches to you yeah it latches on in some energetic way it can keep feeding from you well yeah. also that that PTSD kind of thing it's i mean it's like any reminds me of like the dark stories of alien abduction where it's like the recalling of it is you're it's you're just brought back into that terrifying space where it's like you're reliving that no protection yeah, yeah it's it's one of, yeah exactly that's a good point john it's it's one of those things where it's it's so out of con, out of your control yeah, what are you gonna do call the police right yeah and, yeah and to further clarify the the darkness of this area um this is right down like i think a couple miles he said from the uh the massacre that took place at the washita river which is called uh, Dead. It used to be called Dead Indian Creek, and now it's Dead Warrior Creek. It's a place where you know Custer, the Battle of Wounded oh, Knee. Oh yeah, that, that was a dick. Yeah, it's all happened in that area, and um, in this specific uh, massacre, it says without bothering to identify the village or do any reconnaissance, Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer leads an early morning attack on a band of peaceful Cheyenne living with Chief Black Kettle, killing 103. And then I, I, when the show notes will list, like there's all the warriors that elicited that die, just like, and these are people that had, they had a flag, white flag raised and the guy just went in and I mean, it's a famous right. massacre site. Well, if you know anything about Custer, he was like a, like a, a fame fiend, 
Like he would not just like massacre Indians, but he would also endanger his men all the time. Well, he would that's go without he, doing reconnaissance, and that's, right, how, that's he just how he died. A complete too. narcissist. Oh, complete narcissist, and like always. I mean, he was very successful because he had no fear. Like his goal was, you know, fame, recognition, always gung ho, go straight ahead. But he would always risk the lives of his. No, that's why was it Battle of Wounded? I forget which Wounded Knee or Little Big Horn. I can't remember. Gets like they get destroyed because he just goes in because mm-hmm. yeah. he wants that fame and like just sacrifices everybody in his place. And that megalomania Mass- that he couldn't be stopped. Right. You know? But um, anyways, that adds to that kind of the, the darkness in that area and this, you know, maybe yeah. vengeful sure. energy. Definitely. Um, but it's interesting. He did say that his, uh, his grandmother was full, full blood Cherokee. Cherokee. Yeah. So was he it Cherokee had or Comanche? Was it Cherokee? Cherokee. Cherokee. So he's got Cherokee blood in yeah. him for sure. I wonder if that has anything to do with it or not. With why, maybe why he had the encounter. I'm sure a lot of people out there probably have ancestors that yeah, are... Yeah, most of these stories come from people on the reservation, near the res, but... That's true. A lot that of makes them, sense. There's probably not a lot, a whole lot of... But a lot of them are outsiders like... Outsiders there. Right. And, and the ones that are, I mean, they do seem to have encounters, but a lot of these stories do come from Native people. And it's interesting because he said later in the interview that he he was playing basketball with like some Cherokee, I think Cherokee or Cheyenne friends, I can't remember, but they're noted for having higher raised shoulders like rounded like higher shoulders, picture? like in the picture of the shapeshifter. Oh, interesting. In way, someone noted that to him. Another Cherokee uh, tribal person noted it to him. Like that's a common trait. So that's kind of interesting hmm. anecdote. Um, but yeah, I thought that was a good story and it's good to hear from my own words. The The remaining stories I have are also interesting uh, and some really bizarre. So if you guys... This is a pretty weighty episode towards this part. Like I didn't expect it to be like this intense, but... I know. I And I also thought like... I kind of feel the weight of like what this is in the yeah. room right now almost yeah like it's a well, that's seriousness why that's what i said in the first part of this show in the the regular episode where i like was having that felt like a blanket was being lifted off me last night and i usually i would like yeah. let that go but last, i can see why last night i had to turn around and make sure there wasn't i see why yeah i mean there is sort of like a palpable energy to this topic that is like you're you know it's like it's not dinosaurs in the congo no it's, it's, alive. <laughs> right. it's like you're touching on something that is not just about you. This has deep roots. It's ancient and primal. And maybe maybe these things can sense when they're being talked right, about. Right, like, yeah, it feels like almost like being watched, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel watched now. Yeah. Are we almost done? Uh, <laughs> there's, so there's, a, there's a few more stories. We have Some, a dog no, man outside to protect us. That's true. Jake's out there. Okay, so I have, I have a couple more stories here. You want me to read one and then John can read one? Yeah, if you want to read the next one. Sure. The story hit it. Yeah, hit it. That's what I titled this next story here. And you'll know why. And this touches on what you mentioned in the first part of the episode, Chris, on uh, strange travel experiences. And I'm sorry, I just read one of the the names there. Oh, of the Cranky Man? Cranky Man is one of the, yeah. Wait, Bear Tongue, Tall Bear, Blind Bear, White Bear, Cranky Bear. Cranky Bear. What is that? These all sound like followers of Owen <laughs> Benjamin. <laughs> Blue Horse, Red Teeth, Little Heart, Red Bird. Well, they're Native American names. Yeah, these are all. These are some of the warriors that died in that massacre. No, I care. But it just. So cranky, yeah, way to go, John. John. Cranky Man is just a. <laughs> I know like, it's a great. Threw like, me off. Yeah. Yeah. What's well, the translation to that makes things sound so silly? I'm sure he was like a yeah, like kind of Poor like guy. a grump or something. Yeah, I mean, I think some of these names translate in English, and they're yeah, just they sound right. so silly, but right. obviously had you know. Uh, it was like Watikanta. Yeah, it sounded much cooler, I'm sure, in <laughs> yeah. a, a Navajo or Cherokee. Or I hope we we're not disrespecting anything. Yeah, well, we're coming at this, obviously, with respect. I'm not, we're not trying to, anyways. Yes. It's, a, it's, a, it's kind of an intense topic when you think about all the history. Oh, absolutely. You know, and, and all the, and the tragedy built mm-hmm. into the subject. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, yeah, obviously, we do this with respect, guys, so don't hate us. All right, so where does this story come from, Jer? Okay, so this comes from uh, a subreddit of Skinwalkers on, on Reddit. This comes from user Neptune420, and I checked out their thread. And Neptune 420 sounds legit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I looked at their other stuff, and like I said, like we smoke and weed in space. A lot of the stuff I was looking at was like cat videos, and uh, or you know, so he doesn't have a lot of Skinwalker stories. No, there was like a this is funny point is the person doesn't have a history of paranormal on subreddit or on Reddit. So this is just okay. He that, just dabbled in the makeup stories then. Yeah, or he had an actual encounter. Oh, let's read it. Let's 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 see how it goes. All right, let's see. Readers out there, uh, I haven't read this yet. And you haven't heard it yet, but let, you know, you judge for yourselves. This is Captain legit. Obvious over They here. weren't going to judge for themselves until you told them to, Chris. Mine and my father's Skinwalker Experience by Neptune420. We'll have a link in the show notes. My father owns a small delivery service that operates out of Farmington, New Mexico. We mostly deliver small packages out of the middle of nowhere that are too much of a hassle for the larger delivery companies to bother with. My dad is the only employee, and we have a few pickup trucks and a trailer. 
One day we get a delivery out to Window Rock, Arizona, on the Navajo reservation about two hours from Farmington. My dad gets the call for the job while he is chilling with his Navajo friend, Travis, and his girlfriend. Travis mentions how he's got family in Window Rock that he hasn't seen in ages and suggests they go with him. I was about six or seven at the time, and it was the summertime, so my dad decides we'll go down together. We had to convoy in separate trucks since my dad's was loaded down with freight. We decided to bring along some walkie-talkies so we could communicate with one another. We spend our time in Window Rock. Everything is generally uneventful, and we start heading home along the old highway with my dad and I in front, and tra- What? I just couldn't help but think of the man that made up the term for (laughs) (laughs) walkie-talkie. He's like, I'm walking and I'm I'm talking. I'm walking and I'm talking. (laughs) Walkie-talkie. Makes total sense. (laughs) Sorry. We spend our time in Window Rock. Everything is generally uneventful, and we start heading home along the old highway with my dad and I in front and Travis and his girlfriend in their truck behind us. I honestly don't remember most of the Window Rock trip, but this next part I can never forget. We're somewhere on the highway between Window Rock and Gallup, New Mexico. It had just rained earlier in the day and the road was kind of slick, so we were taking it pretty slow. On the left of the highway, there is nothing but sandstone cliffs and on the right, there was a huge field separated from the road by a small barbed wire fence. We crest the top of this hill and down at the bottom of the hill, we see what appears to be a very large dog sitting back on its haunches in the middle of the road, facing the cliffs. That's weird. It sounds like that story Anna's I read. story, the big black dog. Or the story I read in the first part where it's sitting on its hind- It doesn't conscious. look quite right. Yeah. Right. Okay. My dad calls over the radio. Hey, Trav. You see that big-ass dog? Travis starts yelling back over the radio. That is not a dog. Speed up right away and hit it. He sounds almost hysterical. He just keeps screaming, Hit it. You have to hit it. Please, please hit that fucking thing right now. So my dad starts to speed up, and as we get a bit closer, I can begin to see a little more clearly. It's covered in this brown, wiry, matted hair that almost appears to have dried blood all over it. It's still facing the cliffs, but the moment our headlights hit it, it turns and looks at us, and it has a face. I don't know how else to describe it other than a mix between a bear's and a human's face. It looks twisted and distorted, and almost in pain. As we get closer to this thing, we start to realize it's actually fucking huge. Though it was still sitting on its haunches, it is shoulder height with the hood of the truck. We get literally inches from hitting it when it lets out this scream that sounds like someone screaming as their lungs were filling with water. And it leaps backwards towards the field, landing just on our side of the barbed wire fence. Then, with another leap, it was gone from sight. Travis comes over the radio again. Holy shit, keep driving. We have to get out of here. We have to go faster. He kept repeating this last part. We have to get out of here and we have to go faster. Pretty soon we're speeding like crazy, and just as we start to come near the outskirts of Gallup, we get pulled over. Travis pulls his truck over with us. Naturally, this makes the cop, a Navajo man himself, very on edge, and he immediately asks us why Travis felt the need to pull over as well. Travis says, We just saw a skinwalker a few miles back, and it's been following us. The officer immediately turns white, stammers something about a verbal warning, gets in his car and takes off. We do the same. We didn't see anything else that night, but when we got home, Travis refused to let us leave without taking some kind of Navajo totem thing that was supposed to keep it away. So yeah, I guess that's my Skinwalker story. Sorry for the length, but thank you for reading. If any of you guys have any experiences, I'd love to hear them. I'm scared. (laughs) I am scared. (laughs) Pretty intense. Yeah. You know, I would, if I heard that story for the first time, I'd have way more, like, doubts about it. Absolutely, yeah. I still kind of do. I, I I do too. Right. But... It makes it more plausible after you've heard these same sort of experiences right, yeah. happen over over and over again. Yeah, and some of the similar uh, aspects like that. The, oh, it's good the, to touch misshapen on misshapen things. Yeah. The face that's not quite right. The you know the size of it. You know these. I don't understand why you'd want to hit it though. 
Yeah, that's it seems a little weird. And I mean, also, they said they were inches away from it and it jumped. That was the only other thing that, that, that yeah. seemed exaggerated. Or Right. And I'm sure, you know, stories all the time get exaggerated. And maybe and that was meant to be an exact, like inches meant maybe 20 feet. Mm-hmm. You know? Or this, or Neptune 420 could be full of shit. That's possible too. Yeah, right. it is. Pretty good story though, regardless. Yeah. And I've read other posts that just have to do with basically like that area where he's talking about mm-hmm. other stuff that have nothing like, you know, visit this rock or check this thing out that have nothing to do with the actual, you know, skinwalker. Par- and again, it's, it's not enough, I feel like, to be a made up story. Right. There's not enough crazy. like Yeah, there's not enough craziness to it. It's just real. It's just... He didn't, he didn't attack, you know, no. there was no like... And there wasn't any, I mean, I guess other than the fact that it was like this creature man yeah. beast. Well, the strange thing to me, I mean, and I was reading it, so the details, I'm not sure if I digested them all correctly, but he said he saw this, the face of it twisting in shape from like bear to a man or whatever. No, he said it was like contorted, like it wasn't twisting, it was like... The Looks best like, way you could describe it was between a mix and a, of a bear and a human. Right. Bear and a man's So face. that seems pretty specific if you're trying to just like come up with a skinwalker idea. I mean, my question is, is he, are they driving towards it when he sees it like that? Or are they stopped? Because if they're stopped, I could see how you could take that in. If you're driving and you're like, hit it. And well, you're now you don't slow down, and all of a sudden you're like, but it looked like a mixture. I guess maybe you could if, pull yeah, that if it's, out. If it's in front I think of you, that would probably be it. one of the better ways to when you're driving fast, you just. It's just a mix of like, you probably saw it in an instant. You have enough to be like, it wasn't a dog, it wasn't a man, and it wasn't, it was a mix of right. something. Like, something was wrong it, about it. If you thought it was a dog initially, and then it turned around and its face was like, obviously not just a dog, you would know a mix of something. But I guess that's why it seems a little suspicious to me, because when he says... It looked like con- Robert De Niro when he turned around. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> that would be very suspicious. <laughs> okay, so we have two more stories, guys. Yes, yeah, sorry. We, wow. we got time for them. They're These, much they're shorter. They're good stories, though. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they're, they're interesting. This next story, Chris, uh, this actually connects to the weird story you had about that gray, uh, naked man-looking creature with no face. As I was looking at some of these Skinwalker stories, a lot of them people were saying this is uh, what is called a crawler, this kind of undefined cryptid creature that is very nondescript, almost like the rake, which is a creepypasta, but it's similar. In the yeah, I, I came a lot across a lot of these stories of like sort of pale humanoid, lanky figures along the roadside. I kind of skipped over them because they seemed like... Well, this one to me seems kind of real because he thinks, is this a skinwalker? Because he's read the skinwalker stories. So he tells his story and it's nothing like a skinwalker really okay. but the story I, mean, I, will, I will listen let's have john read the story if you want this is a fun kind of weird one fun ones huh? yeah this is weird and it's it's short it reminds me of our house in stonewood actually okay and this comes from uh hope keys is the username on and we'll have a link to this this one in the show notes too i'm now 18 but i believe it was when i was 15 when it happened for context i live on a native reserve in canada i'm not navajo but I've seen these stories online and realized that what I saw was a skinwalker. It was winter and storming, and I was home alone. The power went out, and my mom, brother, sister, and sister-in-law called me to say that they will continue to drive around since they don't want to sit with no power. I didn't mind because I still had data and just texted my friends. After a while, I hear knocking near the stairs or boots going up or down. I tried to justify this as my golden retriever's tail hitting the wall, but it was far-fetched. It continued and continued, then wasn't in a singular place anymore. I called my mom asking her to come get me. Around five minutes later, my brother opened the door and shouted, We're waiting in the truck, come on! I run to the front door and struggle to put my boots on. Also, for context, my house is a split house, with the front door opening to stairs going up and down. I was able to see up the stairs and down to an extent because of the headlights and moonlight. I got a gross feeling and looked downstairs to see this very long-limbed, gray-white creature crawling on all fours from one side of the basement to the other. It didn't have a face, no clothes, bony around five foot on all fours and looked like a human trying to run like a dog. I've been scared of this ever since and haven't seen it again. I realized skinwalkers was a thing, so I don't know what any of this means. 
laughing my ass off. <laughs> Do I have a skinwalker squatting in my house or something? <laughs> so I it, don't know about this guy. It sounds okay, but this story actually con- connects to a lot of these quote crawler stories. These I know. Weird, I just don't. It's, th- that whole thing feels to me like a creepy pasta. I know. Of thing. I agree, but it, it's real. First of all, I can imagine this, like you hear a knocking, like side to side, the power goes out in your house, you know, and maybe it's his imagination, but the way he describes it connects with this other phenomenon that he's not reporting it as, and he doesn't report it in, he reports it in the Skinwalker thing, and it doesn't really match any of the Skinwalker stories. He just thinks because it's a weird thing, and he lives in an area on a reservation, maybe this is that, and then everyone says, hey, you're in the wrong thread, this is actually a Oh, that is interesting. Yeah, why would he put it in the Skinwalker thread if, it's, right. if he's trying to do a, like a craw- crawler creepypasta thing? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Still, I don't know. I, don't, I just don't know if I this sort of. I mean, if any other stuff is real, is how far fetched is something like that? You know. Well, yeah, and it could be, a, you know, and I, I could found, be total bullshit, but it could be real because all this stuff seems so like out there at this point. Right, and they, you mentioned the rake, which is like a creepy pasta for sure. Like that seems to be right. Where that See, started. he's already familiar with that thing, which right. is which is what he's basically yeah. describing, which is a red flag. Also, like he sees this thing in his house. And it, then it goes into a bedroom or something, and then he's like, no, it, well, was, it was in the basement where he saw it, which but then was he also, it was also a bedroom down sure. there. But then and he's like, what? Do I have something in my house laughing right. my ass off? Yeah. <laughs> Tell me. Yeah, like, it, to me, it's like, he's a little there's, cavalier no, there's no end of the story other than he saw this thing in his basement. Like, I think if this really happened to you, you would you'd be terrified. You'd be terrified and you would have like, you know. It, what happened years ago? And, 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 uh, oh, when you wrote this? Yeah, he said it was when oh, okay. I was 15. Uh, I'm 18 now. It happened. So 15 years. It sounds like he's still 15. Well, yeah. that's harsh, Chris. Yeah, that's okay. harsh. I'm sure Hoppy Keys is an intelligent... No, I'm not, I'm not... Hope Keys. Hope Keys. I'm not dogging him. I'm just saying, uh, you know, we're, what happened at the Out end? Out of all the stories, that is one of the less believable yeah, ones like, we've heard today. W- but. At, at the end, uh, it tried to run like a dog. It was in his house in the, in the basement. It was running all fours. It was five feet tall. Uh, did it? What happened to it afterwards? He doesn't say like it well, left. They left. Well, they left at that moment. His family was outside and called him to leave. So he, that's, he saw it in the last moment when leaving the house. So it's real. <laughs> Come on. Proven. It's a creepy story. Yeah, it could be a creepy pasta, but it's interesting that it didn't align with Skinwalker. That is kind of interesting. To put and in it, the... Then I looked up crawlers because I went down the well, of course. So yeah, I know with Neptune 420, you looked in to see if he had any other paranormal. <laughs> I looked in with him too. Did he, he didn't have a bunch he didn't of like- have anything else. Yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it let's... is interesting when they don't leave any other paranormal stories. Because... Right. That's true. And our first story is the same situation. Okay. This, this is, this is, I like this one. So this is the last one? Yeah. Uh, so the stories I'm not going to do, there's, I heard a reference in the book that I mentioned earlier, skinwalkers, shapeshifters, and... Yeah, that seemed like, a, from what I read of that book, it was really good. They reference in there that they came across in local, in Utah, where they lived in, in the local literature and historical records of the Mormons and the LDS, supposedly. There were actual accounts of, like, when they were coming through a horse and carriage of these things running alongside that were, like, skinwalker, you know... Uh, coyote man creatures running alongside. I couldn't find any other reference to it, though. That's why I didn't include them. But yeah, this next one is interesting because I can really picture going through this country and having this kind of interesting experience. And it's definitely a little different, but uh, it's creepy. It's this uh, night encounter near Zenith, Arizona. True story. Glad this is a forum I can get this off my chest. Summer of 2013, I'm driving a packed U-Haul through a remote section of Navajo County with my 28-year-old daughter following in her car. Middle of the night, pitch black, and the only radio station I could get was KTNN, the Navajo Nation. The DJ had been playing old school country, but just switched it up and suddenly the cab but just switched it up and suddenly the cab of the truck was filled with the otherworldly sounds of the Bear Creek singers. We had just passed the turnoff to the ghost town of Zenith. Nobody lives there. It's just, a, it's just devoid of life. All I could see was the road illuminated by the headlights and that insane music filling my mind. We're doing about 70 and suddenly he was right in front of me. The next couple of seconds goes like this. There, illuminated in the headlights is a figure on all fours, walking across the highway, directly in front of my speeding truck. In place of arms and legs, this creature had four long sticks, and the body was draped in a colorful Navajo-style blanket. No head, just those sticks moving back and forth, slowly propelling him across the road in the middle of the night. I swerved the truck and just missed him, looked in the rear views, and saw him in my approaching daughter's headlights. 
then watched her car make the same last second maneuver to avoid running over him. I was stunned and just kept driving, reassured that she was still behind me. 30 minutes later, we pulled up to her new digs in Snowflake, Arizona, and her first words to me were, what the fuck was that? For the record, she is LDS and almost never swears. Since that night, I myself have moved to Snowflake and driven that same lonely stretch of the 277 fairly often at night, but never while listening to KTNN for fear of creating conditions that would result in a repeat of the incident. I inquired with my native friends up here, and the only advice was, don't tell that story anymore. So I still think gods, superstitions, and everything else is BS, but will go to my grave believing native cultures hold powerful secrets that the rest of us don't understand. Skinwalkers are real, and apparently they like to mess with ignorant whites like me. Appreciate any feedback because, like I mentioned, our native friends won't discuss it with us, and nobody believes me except my kid. Oh, and I'm now a big fan of native drum ceremonies, song, and music. But something good did come out of this experience. Do you want to hear the music that was playing on the radio? I sure. Found, I found this is the song. <laughs> okay. This is the song that, was, that just came on and that created the condition, supposedly. So it's a stick blanket walking across the street? Yeah, well, I thought it was interesting. Yeah, I, I couldn't th- quite imagine it. What I thought was interesting about the story, so it was this no head. F- figure with covered in like a Navajo, you know, ceremonial blank, colorful blanket, it sounded like sticks. And like these suggested in the comments further on that like maybe it was like a skinwalker type ceremony or initiation where there's like this kind of training of walking on fours, you know, like becoming the skin. I mean, it's just bizarre to be out in the middle of nowhere, you know, and this thing is in the middle of the highway, this person you know, walking across. And it doesn't, it's not what I thought was... Did it say it was a person? Well, they assumed because it's under this blanket using sticks for legs. no head. Yeah, well, I would assume because it's covered with the blanket, but maybe not. I mean, I just think it's... But he said skinwalkers are real, so... Yeah. Whatever this is, like, he thought it was a skinwalker, so it didn't seem like it was in its natural form if skinwalkers are... Yeah, whether it was caught in like mid ceremonial transformation or some kind of like skinwalker. Yeah, obviously, initiation. whatever it was. I mean, this is all conjecture. Yeah. Whatever it was, it wasn't a prank. Probably like just some like teenager out there doing that in the middle of the night. Well, you how do you get be... how do you get something to look like sticks under a blanket unless you got like? And why would you do that? Some sort of robot. Why would you do that unless it was like a prank? A prank, or to I mean, a deadly prank. You know, you're gonna get run over on the road. Yeah, who you knows? Know. There are definitely a lot of weird people in the world. But truth. This is the song that came on the radio right before you heard it. All right, if you're driving right now, right now out there. Oh, wow, yeah. Imagine sure. that coming in on the radio and then just seeing something walking across the road. The Bear Creek Singers, obviously a popular tribal group. Yeah, band, no, it's, you know? it's cool. I mean. I don't know, I just thought that radio playing that and then seeing this thing painted a cool visual in my mind yeah. and sonically. Strange story. That's intense saying, though. I mean, those are lyrics, too. Like, yeah, they're singing about they're something. They're singing in another language. Right, we obviously don't know. We're ign- ignorant of this uh, specific song. I might and, have to pull it up though later. It sounds kind of interesting. Yeah. yeah, I thought it was cool to paint the picture of like what he actually heard on the radio. I right. think, and obviously it's a, it's a modern group doing a, um, traditional music mm-hmm. and everything, but the idea of creating the conditions where you're, you know, not necessarily that, that those conditions conjured this ceremonial skinwalker ritual in the road or whatever. Right. It could have had something to do with it. It could. I mean, just imagining that place and being out there and then that happened. I mean, I've been yeah. on the road. No, hearing that roads. song and being in the middle of nowhere. And if you ever listen to the radio out at night by yourself yeah. and just like that you atmosphere. Conjure up some interesting. Especially if you're like, you're on one of those trips where you're like burned out, you're driving, you're at like the ends of your your nerves, like just trying to get to the next stop. And then and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, as awesome as that is, it, that intensity all of a sudden in the middle of the night, like, I could, I mean, I feel like you could just start hallucinating. Potentially. Or summoning spirits. Yeah, seeing things you're not supposed to see. What do you think, listeners, as we wrap up this expansion episode? Hope you, hope you felt like you were, you know, dipping into some really good juice. Okay. I'm, weird, I'm on my end of my nerves. Sorry. Some weird travel juice for you guys. I hope you guys have a great holiday and uh, maybe visiting your families. And yeah, when you're on the Stay road. Stay safe and, and be wary of evil because it is real. Yes. And keep your loved ones close and just fill yourself with that loving holiday spirit and being around family because that's what, that's what life's really about, guys, right? 
Right. Um, oh, and we should mention this. Merch store is open. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> as we, Life's really as we respectfully <laughs> tell the tales of uh, occulted witchcraft in the Navajo. Uh, but yeah, if any guys are on the res, near the res, or have friends, or are in the Southwest and have stories, or just want to enlighten us on more clarification, write in. And thanks to everyone that's left speak pipes that we haven't got to yet or written messages. We're catching up on uh, some stingers for sure for all you awesome patrons. Uh, so hang in there. Got a little there. backed up this week. Sorry about yeah, that. But. With, you know, just managing day jobs. But hopefully as we're building the Patreon, getting more opportunities, this is going to be something that we can do and keep growing. Yeah. And for all of you new patrons out there, welcome aboard. And we are so glad you're here. And we'll see you guys next time. On the Belief Hall. In the Belief Hall. In the Belief Hall. In it. I guess it's it. Good night. Good night. <laughs>